Wow, this kitchen game in which I'm simulating a cheese grater sure is immersive. Oh hey, didn't see you there. You know, with the pandemic ravaging the world and tearing innocent lives from families, not entirely, but mostly due to the incompetence of duly elected leaders, I think there's never been a greater time in history than now to plug our ears, close our eyes, and scream as loud as we can until the hell passes on. This thing's also a pretty good distraction, too. We live in an age of technology, one that's so advanced that home VR is no longer a novelty. That's up your plans. <laughs> Okay, but seriously, more people are buying these things than ever before, and that's not just because the technology surrounding them is getting more advanced and more easily accessible, it's because we've got an ever-expanding library of excellent VR titles. So let's talk about them today. I want to take a look at all the games that I have played in virtual reality since I got my Oculus Rift S back in December of 2019. Now, I'm not just going to be talking about anything today, I want to talk specifically about games that are built from the ground up for virtual reality. So things like No Man's Sky or Subnautica, that just happen to have VR support after the fact, the UI is bad, I'm not talking about it. In addition, I've also reviewed Half-Life Alex and Boneworks previously on this channel, so while I'll make reference to them in this video, I'm not going to be addressing them directly. If you want to check those out, go check them out on my channel, please. So without further ado, let's get immersed. First up is Pavlov, the more popular of the two tactical shooters for VR, the other being Onward. Pavlov is what I know, because if I'm being 100% honest, I saw a video of Onward, saw Pavlov as a top VR seller on Steam, and I got it thinking they were the same thing. I've never tried Onward, so take this with a grain of salt, but from discussions with friends, I've been told to think of it as Pavlov is CSGO, while Onward is more akin to Rainbow Six or Insurgency. Either way, I usually tend to enjoy the less realistic and more frantic nature of shooters that only partially ground themselves in reality, so I think this is the one for me. But this isn't an Onward versus Pavlov segment, this is a what do I think of Pavlov segment. The answer is, of course, it's great, but not without its flaws. I'm gonna work on the assumption that not everyone knows how Counter-Strike works, so in brief, a game of Pavlov takes place on a small map with two teams, a team tasked with planting a bomb, and a team tasked with stopping them. If Team Bomb manages to plant their bomb, the Team Counter-Bomb has a short amount of time to defuse it. Alternatively, either team can win by simply eliminating the other team. Winning or losing a round grants a certain amount of money, where winning grants more than losing. At the beginning of each round, players buy armor, grenades, and bigger weapons. Where I think Pavlov sets itself apart from the Counter-Strike formula the most, aside from being a VR game, is in the granted ability to carry much more firepower. In good old CS, you can carry one primary weapon, be it a rifle, SMG, or heavy, and then you can have your pistol and knife. A couple nades on the side, and that's it. In Pavlov, you can carry all of this on you without any issue. As someone with 2,500 hours on CSGO, I find the additional weaponry is absurdly empowering. It adds so many more variables to each encounter with an enemy. While I have yet to encounter someone using this tactic, it is possible to dual wield ops, the mere thought of which keeps me awake at night. All the guns feel great in this game, whether you're letting a volley fly from the barrel of an SMG taking precision aim with a hefty sniper rifle or going for an iconic one dig. Everything is clicky and satisfying. The ability to dual wield every weapon makes you feel omnipotent too. At least until you need to reload. But reloading being a pain in the ass isn't just exclusive to power trippers. The game's blunt but functional tutorial teaches you that there are two methods of releasing a magazine from your weapon. The first has you pull the magazine directly out of the gun with your hand, the other has you press a button on the controller to release the magazine. Here's the thing, both methods don't work on every gun. I can drop the mag out of my M4, but I can't grab it? I understand this is how an AR-15 works in real life, but why not keep things consistent for the sake of gameplay? Well, it, it has to be realistic. No, it doesn't, TJ Henry Yoshi. That's what Onward is for. And I'm only so anal about it because I've died one too many times trying to reload my rifle only for my gloved hand to whiz right through my rifle magazine and out the other side, and this guy turns the corner and shotguns me. It's not that big of a deal though, because I usually find myself using one gun and one gun only, the auto shoddy. It's one of the new heavy weapons alongside the Barrett M99, which I don't care for because it might as well be a must get with how long it takes to reload between firing a bullet the size of a cucumber. But I digress. The auto shoddy is unstoppable at close range because, well, actually, why don't I just show you? It might as well be a chainsaw with a 10-foot blade that you've given to a 9-year-old who is now swinging it with all the caution that the developers took when coding the weapon stats. Yeah, Counter-Strike in its 20 years of existence has never been particularly level, but you don't have to follow that blueprint despite what you might believe. I mean, you didn't name the teams Terrorist and Counter-Terrorist, so you might as well change everything else besides the explosive Play-Doh. Now, I thought I was done with this review, and I almost forgot this, and I'm sure that almost anyone who's played Pavlov also watching right now has also forgot this, but there's a zombie mode. And you might think this zombie mode is horrible given the nature of counter strike combat, but it turns out that the one-shot headshot 
rule applies rather well to a zombie game. Four new weapons spawn on a box each round, and it just goes on forever in the same room. Sure, it's bare bones and it feels somewhat tacked on, but it's perfectly functional, save for the stagger mechanic. You can make a shoving motion with your gun to knock back the infected if they get too close, but personally I would have liked to have been able to throw my gun into the horde, knocking them back as I grab my other rifle off my back to blast them to bits, but we can't have it all, can we? It's decidedly engaging. I'd be more surprised if it wasn't, given that it's a VR game and you have screening things running in your direction. I just wish that it had more personality. Despite these gripes, the game is great. Of course, people look odd holding their weapons, but you'll get over it quickly. The models and textures all look polished, the maps are well constructed, if a little lacking in terms of detail, and as I mentioned before, the gunplay is just wonderful. At least until you need to reload. So for those reasons, today, I think we can give Pavlov a solid 7 out of 10. Next up on the list of shooters, Arizona Sunshine, which is a solid testament to how rapidly virtual reality is developing. This came out in 2016, and already, compared to Half-Life Alex or even the barren halls of Boneworks, this game looks like donkey ass. Ass ass. But as we all know, visuals aren't everything. So how's the gameplay? You might ask. See, the core elements, which really means the shooting of the zombos, works and feels fine. The guns are not nearly as punchy as those in Pavlov and Boneworks, but they do the job. You do have to hold them at a bit of a sharper angle than in any other VR shooter I've played so far. It's fine once you get used to it, but it's noticeably less comfortable. Reloading, on the other hand, is a different story. I actually quite like the reload system that Sunshine uses. Instead of using a free hand to load a magazine, you just slap your controller against your chest, which admittedly did take a little getting used to with the Rift S controller. Ow. Regardless, the gameplay loop here consists of exactly what you think it does. Shoot the head, you win. It's satisfying at first, and remains satisfying enough for me to play through a four-hour story campaign, but I can't help wondering what the point of half the guns I found lying around was. Okay, get this. A 9mm pistol such as a Glock or Beretta can one-shot a zombie by means of rapid administration of lead to the brain. At one point, I found a revolver and thought to myself, well, this will do more damage than my 9mm, but then immediately die because six shooters only shoot six shots. Try saying that ten times fast. Upon respawning with my 9mm in my hand, I realized, wait, you can't do better than one shot, one kill, no luck, just skill. So what's the point of the revolver? I later found that the revolver only takes two body shots to kill, where the 9mm pistol takes three, as if I'm some sort of troglodyte. Do you think I've never shot someone in the head? Well, I haven't, except for that one time at Burger King, but still, there's no reason to use the revolvers or the deagle for that matter, because the 9mm pistols you find will always have at least double the magazine size. Not to mention that the extra body shot that you have to make with the 9mm pistols is completely benign because of the buckets of ammo that the game provides you with. I played through on normal mode, which supposedly provided a quote-unquote medium amount of ammunition, and everyone and their mom was packing literal crates of ammo in Arizona. I was almost always maxed out on pistol ammo, even if I wasn't being particularly surgical with my aim. On the other side of the coin, I could not keep my poor Uzi or shotgun fed. Poor bastards just sat on my belt for most of the game, occasionally making a dusty cough. And even if I had little ammo for them, I was never using them for long because the zombie rushes are fast, and switching your weapon out can be deadly, especially when the holster mechanic is fucking broken. About half the times that I attempted to interact with the weapons on my hip, I encountered a bizarrely specific bug. If I holstered my weapon on my right hip, I could only grab it with my left hand, and vice versa. At least, that's what I think was happening. I reached out to the bug for further comment, but it was too busy making someone else do a shitty interpretation of the Macarena in the middle of a zombie wave. Now, I mentioned it in my Half-Life Alex review, but the worst thing a VR game like this can do is break your immersion, and it seems like Arizona Sunshine is trying its absolute hardest to do that at moments like this. And this is without mentioning the constant object pop in, object pop out, this broken sniper scope that literally makes entities invisible, and horrible inconsistency with held objects. I reached a point where I saw a 3D die on a table amongst a bunch of playing cards, and I figured, well, all the cards are flat, but of course I went to pick up the die, and I couldn't. Instead a card floated into my hand. This constant subverting of expectation makes Arizona Sunshine a headache for anyone who cares about details. There was also a point where I encountered an axe on a couch, and I went to pick it up thinking, well, this is obviously placed in the very center of the couch because you want me to use it as a melee weapon, and it of course it didn't work! Didn't even do anything when I threw it at a zombie. Now I haven't even said anything about the story yet, and that's mainly because there isn't one. There's no explanation for the zombies, they just exist and we accept that. The character, or lack thereof, which I had to play as, was about as bland as the zombie apocalypse survivor can get. He's a lone dude with no friends or family, no motive besides survive, and his defining personality trait is that he calls all the zombies Fred, which I want to say is an I am legend kind of thing to keep him from going insane, but at least Will Smith had a dog that he cared about. Yeah, there's nothing here interesting story-wise. So after all that, what is redeeming about Arizona Sunshine. The shooting and not much else, honestly. For less than 44 Canadian, I can get much better VR experiences. You know, maybe there's something to be said about a zombie shooter not translating or adapting well to the hardware of tomorrow. It was a genre so overdone from the mid-2000s to the late 2010s, but I, then I guess it'd be trying to make a profound statement involving the term zombie, which is some Tumblr shit, so let's just move on. For those reasons, yada yada, this is a 4 out of 10. But what if you don't want to shoot things? You want to slash things? Then for you, I have Beat Saber. Beat Saber is Beat Saber. It's the perfect app for both 
both newcomers and veterans alike. As with most rhythm games, it's deceptively simple, easy to pick up, and difficult to master. The game requires immense amount of precision to crack those high scores, let alone clear a level without fail. The beauty of Beat Saber is that it allows you to get really into the flailing without ever requiring you to move. As such, an expert level can carry the intensity of a firefight without requiring a player to have their VR legs. Of course, the other side of that is that Beat Saber isn't exactly what I would call an immersive experience, it's the most arcade-like out of all the VR titles I own. But this doesn't make it bad. I just feel like it's capitalizing less on the abilities of VR than most other games out there right now. Your standard Beat Saber map is anywhere from 3 to 5 minutes, with difficulties easy through Expert Plus. In place of a 3 or 5 or 10 strikes you're out system, Beat Saber takes the approach popularized by Osu, that is, you have a health bar, missing depletes it rapidly, hitting notes refills it slowly. This usually means that you'll have to screw up about 5 or more times in a row in order to fail. For some reason I can't really decipher though, the game starts you off with half health, so you have to hit quite a chain before being able to take many hits. Visually, Beat Saber finds a happy medium between flashy and overwhelming. The way the light blades dance between the flurry of colored blocks is satisfying and makes me feel like a neon ninja, at least until I remember in reality, I look like a monkey swatting wasps. I might as well mention this here as well, because it seems to be the only VR title where this happens to me, but either due to the design of the Rift S controllers or my own incompetence, I found difficulty in playing for more than 30 minutes at a time without thwacking the headset. Actually, after writing that out, I realize it's probably my own incompetence, but whatever. Putting my tiny ape brain aside though, Beat Saber has plenty to offer for any and all owners of VR. There's a campaign which, in reality, is a lengthy tutorial accompanied by the occasional challenge. Personally, I think it stretches the core game mechanics a bit thin, asking the player to complete miscellaneous challenges that only somewhat help prove a player's skills. And the final level isn't even difficult. You can clear the whole campaign in about three hours if you're new, two if you know what you're doing. I suppose the campaign serves more to show the player where they are in terms of developing their skill, but if you clear the final level and then go and try and play any of the Camellia levels on Expert, you'll quickly be put in your place. The beat maps included in the game are very well made, though. They feel as though a lot of thought went into positioning and overall feel. I certainly appreciated them even more after playing custom-made community levels. Let me tell you those are <laughs> There's also plenty of accessibility options, even an audio delay adjuster for those with input lag. It's not the best VR game, but it is the one I return to most. It's easy to strap yourself in, play for a quarter of an hour, and hop out if you've only got a time for a quickie. Great fun, easy to run, kids can play cause lack of gun. If you have a VR headset, you should own Beat Saber. For those reasons, today, I think we can give Beat Saber an easy 8 out of 10. But what if you want a sword-based game that doesn't rely on muscle memory, rather requiring rapid reflexes not unlike those often associated with the covert mercenaries of 12th century feudal Japan, and also about fruit? What? You didn't want that last part? Ah well, here's Fruit Ninja anyway. The original Fruit Ninja for Android and iOS will always have a very special place in my heart. While you were out there subway surfing and jetpack joyriding, I was mastering the blade. The bamboo shoot blade, anyway. The game is impossible without it. But you want to hear about Fruit Ninja VR? Well, there was initially a more realistic VR title that took the idea of Fruit Ninja and projected it into a 3D environment. That was Zenblade. Not to be confused with that RPG starring the shirtless kid from Smash. Zenblade was taken down for legal reasons unrelated to Halfbrick, so now we have the official Fruit Ninja VR uncontested. Halfbrick really came out swinging for a first VR title, in my opinion. The cartoonish style is more bright and colorful than it ever was on mobile, and it runs impeccably well thanks to its simplicity. It is entirely possible that I just like the visual style for faux nostalgic reasons, but ignorance is bliss. Why else would I be putting on a VR headset? In terms of gameplay, we have the three modes for mobile, which is classic, arcade, and the one for the Kirby players. There's also a new mode, exclusive to VR, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Universally, the game modes consist of slicing fruit that shoots up from a row of bamboo cannons at your feet, and this is my first big issue with the game. This thing is way too damn wide. I don't know what Half Break expects from from its player base, but a game about precision is made exponentially more difficult when there's targets constantly outside of my field of view. This is especially frustrating when I get a frenzy power-up in arcade mode, which makes the fruit shoot out of the corners of the what is this, a plaza or a dojo? Yeah, don't be expecting any story about growth or the hardships of a young ninja boy, because this is an arcade game. Which is pretty grating, given that only one of the four game modes is labeled as such. I will give credit where credit's due, though. The survival mode is straight up awesome. Sure, the idea of slashing things approaching you in VR has been a staple of the medium for a while, but I found survival to be a clever application. You stand with your blade ready as bucket stick fruit copters hover around and hurl volleys of fruit and bombs at you from different angles. This is without a doubt the best part of Fruit Ninja VR. It demands your focus more than any other game mode, using the environment as a playstation instead of the backdrop. Though it's not perfect. I said that the field of view thing was my biggest issue, but the hick detection is probably the bigger gripe. Sure, it works well 99% of the time, but it just makes that 1% stick out even more. And when it does mess up, it's controller throwing levels of rage inducing. In survival mode, it's arguably the most crucial too. Look, I understand that most people looking to purchase Fruit Ninja for their thousand dollar plus VR setup are just gonna go the whole time, but I care about this kind of thing. So for those reasons, today, I think we can give Fruit Ninja VR a six and a half out of 10. But maybe let's just 
hypothetically say that you're the third type of sword person. If you don't wield it in the name of EDM or papayas, then what do you wield it for? Could it be to fight a legendary beast of old? To search ancient tombs and find treasure? To battle for the glory of your people? Skyrim VR is so lame. To review Skyrim is to review Skyrim VR. This is a game nearly a decade old asking full price, not for a gorgeous HD remake with fluid and lifelike animations, improved AI, and menus made specifically for VR, it's just Skyrim with your virtual reality headset. I suppose the most glaring issue is the fact that your controllers are often visible if your hand is unusable, and it takes exactly three seconds of fade-in to realize that this is the case. Somehow, I ended up feeling less immersed standing in the center of my room than I did eight years ago when I played this for the first time, sitting at my desk. It doesn't take long for the game to disappoint further, though, because because we disembark, witness democracy, and then the fucking menu comes up. What the hell is this? Who thought that this was okay? I understand that if the menus were different from what was present in Skyrim, there would be a crop of pungent 30-something-year-olds raging about it on a message board with a serious frog infestation, but who cares about them? These menus are somehow even more ass than they were in the original game, and that says something because I hate this four-point star more than Dante hated the Florentine. And if you don't get that reference, I encourage you to read the Divine Comedy for two reasons. It's not as frustrating as Skyrim VR, and it's cheaper than Skyrim VR. I'd ask for my money back, but I can't really do that on a game that I pirated because I anticipated it to be this shit. And before any of you Kantians attack me for being amoral, you can go tell Todd Howard about it, because I'm sure he'll wipe away his tears with his wads of hundreds. Now, I started off this list by stating that I wasn't going to review games that were simply made VR compatible, yet what Skyrim VR seems to be doing is just that. The difference is, Skyrim VR asks for 80 Canadian, whereas a game like Subnautica just includes it. Bethesda being the money-hungry gremlins they usually are is no surprise, but I was hoping for a lot more than this. I will concede that the mountains and distant plains are quite beautiful to see in first person, but other other than that, I cannot find a good reason to buy and play this, unless you're a really big fan of Skyrim. It's functional, but a worse experience in every way save for the exploration. So for those reasons, today, I think we're gonna give Skyrim VR a 3 out of 10. But now that we've seen a game that is worse in VR, how about a game that's better in VR? Super Hot VR is the follow-up to the original 2016 game that shattered the mold of first-person shooters. If you don't know anything about Super Hot, the game revolves around a mechanic that I still love to this day. Time only moves when you do. It was already cool in the original game, but being able to physically lean back and limbo underneath a shotgun blast is about 16 times cooler in VR. In terms of gameplay, everything is a notch up. Throwing weapons in faces when you run out of ammo, being able to throw a punch and watch the red men literally fall to pieces, nailing an enemy directly in the face with a shuriken. There's even a new form of attack which I don't believe was in the original game, which is cool but not effective enough to warrant using so long as you have a gun. Which you almost always do, by the way. There are a few things that the original Super Hot didn't do well, and they aren't improved here. The game is still absurdly short. You can finish this in an afternoon, and if you're in to it like I was, you probably will. Now obviously, what little there is to play here is terrific. The levels are challenging and it's obvious that a fair amount of planning and testing went into their creation. Having said that, it's not like they're painstakingly detailed. Even if you were just reusing different areas of level like the skyscraper, but providing different weapons creating a new challenge out of existing assets, I wouldn't have complained. Because of its short length, though, Superhot gets away with only having a handful of weapons. You'll forgive me for wanting precision in a game where a single bullet means having to repeat multiple combat sections, but I forego the SMG whenever a pistol or shotgun is available to me. Watching your shot connect in slow motion was a feeling that never lost its charm, though melee combat managed to. Once you realize that a simple flick of the wrist carries the same impact as an uppercut, the game ends up feeling like Just Dance for Wii. Sure, I know that I'm actively choosing to shortcut my way through the game by swinging the remote around my wrist by the strap, but you're not gaslighting me into ignoring your input oversights. If I can do this in the first place, it's your fault. I suppose what takes me out of the game the most, though, are the moments where I need time to pass a little bit, so I just awkwardly stand dancing while I wait for the red guy with the axe to peek the corner. Maybe that's what the telekinesis powers were intended to be used for, time passing? Mind you, most of the issues I have brought up here are situational, save for the short length, but me wanting more of the game should tell you that what's here is stellar. The minimal art style is fantastic, the combat is fluid and dreamlike, and what it lacks in story it easily makes up for with solid level design. And for those reasons, today, I think we can give Super Hot VR an 8 out of 10. Last but not least, we have VR Chat. VR Chat is literally unreviewable. It's just the Steam VR home, but slightly less interactive and slightly more hentai, I mean multiplayer. I don't understand why everyone in this game has to act forcedly and unbearably weird. Of all the VR games I have played, this is the most novelty of them all. It's buggy, ugly, but most importantly, it's boring unless you have some interesting characters on your server. Um, help. I've broken <laughs> It's entirely dependent on your online experience because there's no gameplay otherwise. I guess I can give it a shrug out of 10. I just don't really get it. So those are all the major VR titles I have played thus far, save for Half-Life, Alex, and Boneworks. If you're watching this as someone looking to get into VR, I hope my assholeish opinions don't turn you away. I like to give my honest thoughts on things, but at the same time, I like to whine because it's fun. My opinion is only my own, so if you disagree, please let me know your thoughts on anything I've covered today. Again, if you would like to know my thoughts on Bonezone and Halix, don't hesitate to check those videos out too. And if you like 
liked this video, let me know what you want to see talked about next, and I'll try not to take so long to do it this time. Thank you.